I'm delighted to be joined in person here by Professor Tim Nuttell. We stalled until you got here. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, we, we started a few minutes past um, and we took we have plenty of time. So thank you for flying in this morning to be with us in person. Uh, so we'll go to you next and then I will go to Philip Zellico. Uh, back on Zoom. So thanks again to Matt in the room who was coordinating our back and forth between virtual and in person. And Professor Tinnatelli is joining us from New York University. He has a background here. Uh, he holds a doctorate in history from Harvard. He's also from my native country of Canada, but I believe now dual Canadian American. Uh, and he holds appointments at NYU in both history and public service, where he also directs the public policy major. He is the author of numerous books, including the award-winning One Hell of a Gamble, Khrushchev, Castro, and Kennedy, 1938-1964, as well as Khrushchev's Cold War, which made it into the Foreign Affairs 2014 Top 10 Best Books of the Cold War. Uh, and he has also served as a consultant to the 9-11 Commission and has appeared in numerous media outlets. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to him. Thank you very much for you. Um, uh, I, I very much enjoyed uh, Chris's uh, nuclear staff ride, um, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to see Chris Andrew. I met uh, when I was a graduate student here, uh, and have benefited uh, just as I benefited from Phil Zelico's work, um, benefited from Chris Andrew's work my entire career. Um, uh, I'm going to start where Chris ended, which was the fact that uh, this is a crisis that. Uh, that young people, students felt just as their parents felt. And it's one reason why I think that uh, the current Ukrainian crisis is very interesting because the two uh, leaders, of all, the leaders of both superpowers had a recollection of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, Putin is 10 years younger, of course, than Biden, but Putin is old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis as a school boy. Um, I um, I was quite liberal in approaching how what I would talk about. Um, I love telling stories about the case Um but I I thought that <clears throat> what I would do is I would talk about continuities and discontinuities in intelligence between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Ukrainian crisis, because in both um, I see continuities and discontinuities. Um, and in the ten minutes that I have, I'd like to point out three. Uh, which might be the basis for a further discussion or Q and A, at least. <clears throat> the first is the lackluster performance of the Kremlin information system. One thing that struck me when the SVR, that's the <clears throat> Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, opened its records from the Cuban Missile Crisis, and actually from the period just before, to Alexander Perzenko and me in the 1990s, was how poor. Russian intelligence, Soviet intelligence really was. The era of the Cambridge Five, the five superb uh, moles who provided the very best political intelligence one could imagine to the Soviet leadership had faded. Uh, not all of the Cambridge Five were yet in Moscow. Philby would take a while and Blunt never actually got to Moscow. He was allowed to stay as curator of Queen, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's paintings, a story in and of itself. Um, and the era of Hansen and Ames was yet to come. Um, the human forces that dominated KGB reporting uh, just before and during the Cuban Missile Crisis were mainly foreign journalists in the United States. Uh, what was most striking, however, was the poverty of analysis. The KGB's analyses of U.S. foreign relations moves or U.S. foreign policy moves of U.S foreign policy decision-making apparatus were self-contradictory. Um, it, 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 seemed, it seemed from reading, and I read a lot of them, that uh, the Soviet analysts were afraid uh, to make any grand conclusions. And so the analysis usually had three or four. So then if the presidium, then called the, uh, now called the Politburo, I mean, later called the Politburo and earlier called the Politburo, if the presidium decided something else, the analysts him, himself, and they were generally men, would not be held responsible for getting it wrong. And so these were very, very difficult documents to read. I don't mean the Russian was difficult. Actually, it was pretty simple because it was sort of Soviet Russian 
just not as beautiful as Pushvin's Russian. Um, but the but the but the analysis was very cool. Um, now you contrast that with Sherman Kent of CIA's famous national intelligence estimate saying under no circumstances would the Soviets put missiles in Cuba, which is very clear. I'm sure. Sure. Although Sherman Kent, to, to his final days, would argue that that was still a good analysis. It was Khrushchev who made the mistake, not the CIA. <laughs> uh, that um, the fact is, Soviet analysis was terrible, um, and in addition, was often polluted by the less subtle concepts we associate with Marxism, Leninism. Um, <clears throat> as Serhii Prokhi, I, I apologize. I, probably mispronounced his, his name, underscores in his excellent and much more recent book, there were voices, largely human voices, gently suggesting to Khrushchev that Operation Anadir could not be kept secret. And, and it took a while for even the Soviet military to convince itself that, that probably the American U-2 spy plane would catch sight of these missiles before they were both fully deployed and fully operational. But it appears at least from the material we saw, and Alexander, who alone of the two of us had access also to the presidential archives, was able to double check this material. We never saw any evidence that the intelligence community was ever asked to assess the logic of this Operation Undeer at any point. Um, I was also struck by the cynical vapidity of Vladimir Semichesny who was the KGB chief at the time. I spent an afternoon with him in 1994. Um, he claimed to have learned about Anadir after it was policy. And then he tried to explain why he was such a terrible spy master. He said, I didn't want to be. He said to me, I know nothing about this. I, he said, I told Khrushchev when he selected me um, I, to replace the much more um, uh, the veteran and more professional Ashlimbin. Uh, I, I'm not a professional. I know nothing about this business. And Khrushchev said, great. <laughs> Our professionals commit a lot of follies. We need political men who will be feared a little. Well, I point out this evidence in light of the fact that Putin, an intelligence professional, has committed a lot of follies. And so Khrushchev was right. And this is a continuity. The <laughs> Russian intelligence system it's clearly bad at this moment. The extent to which it is bad, well, none of us can really tell, except we see the outcome. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, Putin, who is nostalgic about the Soviet era, has reconstructed the same kind of very poor analytical system, which discourages people from writing analyses that are clear and possibly contradictory to the expectations and assumptions and perceptions of the leader. I don't know, but one of the things that struck me in, in learning how the Soviets uh, structured their documentary system was that I learned from my friends here at Harvard who were doing imperial Russian history that in a sense, the Soviets had, had adopted some of the imperial Russian ways of documenting decisions. For example, the Politburo, in a sense, adopted the way in which uh, the imperial council had made decisions. So it wouldn't surprise me if Putin has managed to reconstruct the worst elements of the Soviet intelligence system that we saw on display in 1962. The second point is, is a discontinuity, and that is regarding the U.S. intelligence system ahead of a crisis. I'm working on a new book about JFK as president, which is required that I return to the missile crisis with fresh eyes. Before the famous, third, and I'll just give you the headlines because we don't have time for me to explain why, but I could be you know, happy to do so in Q&A later. But before the famous 13 days, John F. Kennedy was a victim of a culture of secrecy, largely of his own making. Seeing Cuba as a problem in the midterm elections of 1962, and by the way, midterms always matter. Those of you who study U.S. foreign policy always find out if there's a midterm uh, <laughs> nearby, always matter. He shut down the analysis analysis of raw intelligence product about Soviet offensive weapons systems in Cuba within the policymaking level of the NSC system. The unintended effect was that it, it, this raw intelligence was also not put in his 
intelligence checklist, which is what the president's daily brief was called in that era. So he did not see raw data that was actually contradicting his basic assumption that the crisis that fall would be over Berlin and not over Cuba. Meanwhile, fearful of a politically difficult shootdown of a U-2 over Cuba, he refused to permit U-2 flights over the island in September when he would have been shown photographs, which he was allowed to look at because he said he wanted only corroborated information about missiles in Cuba. The photograph would have been corroborated information, but he didn't allow those U-2s to fly. So it was impossible to corroborate the very good intelligence that was coming from U.S. agents on the island of Cuba. Contrast this with the evident handling of intelligence about Putin within the Biden administration. I assume that students, and I hope some of us will still be around, will be using the Biden administration's handling of intelligence in the run-up to the Russian invasion as a great case study. I do not believe we should consider Kennedy's use of intelligence before October 16th, 1962, however, as a positive case study. Um, it wasn't a failure for reasons we all know, but it wasn't because of the president's um, approach to intelligence at all. Finally, a topic area of both continuity and discontinuity. And that's U.S. intelligence on Soviet command and control of nuclear weapons in a crisis. As my former colleague in the Miller Center, David Coleman, demonstrated some years ago, the Kennedy administration was well aware that the Soviets had tactical nuclear weapons at Cuba during the crisis. It didn't take the Glasnost re revelations for Robert McNamara to find out. He knew, already knew about them. What the so U.S. didn't know was the number of these missions. Um, and the fact that the Soviets had put nuclear tip uh, torpedoes on their submarines. And the United States didn't know what the Soviets planned to do with these missiles and torpedoes. The tactical nuclear weapons then, as I believe now, relied on a dual use system. And determining which use they might have can require knowing whether they have nuclear warheads. And the United States couldn't find the nuclear warheads on Cuba during the crisis. Nor could the United States determine the orders for their control. The tactical nuclear weapons, though they were spotted, the, uh, the Lunas were spotted, remain a black hole for military and civilian analysts in the Pentagon and the White House. And at length, I, I leave to those who know the battle of space better than me in 2022, uh, about the extent to which we know the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons in Russian occupied Ukraine. But President Biden's recent comments suggest that this remains an intelligence problem, but with an interesting twist, which brings me to my final point, which is the discontinuity, and which means I can end on a positive note. The last discontinuity is this during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Neither side had good intelligence on the decision-making system of the other. Khrushchev had to rely on tidbits learned from a barman at the National Press Club named Johnny Prokovs, who overheard a conversation with two American journalists to, to have a sense of whether, the, whether Kennedy was serious about launching an invasion. He also had information that the NI had gone to a different DEFCON level. But we know from the way in which the KGB handled this information that the barman heard, that Moscow was very interested because in many ways it was the only inside look that it had on Kennedy's decision-making process. The Soviets didn't know anything about the, about the XCOM. Meanwhile, the XCOM couldn't understand why Khrushchev's diplomatic efforts, once they started through the letters, were so contradictory. But in 2022, as in 2016, the United States intelligence community inputs, in, imputes responsibility to Putin with confidence for certain decisions. That is something the U.S. government was not able to do in the Cuban Missile Crisis regarding Khrushchev. Indeed, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a debate over whether the military had taken control of the, of the leadership. And that would explain why the tone of two letters were so fundamentally different. But we've seen the U.S. government, both in the run-up to Ukraine and in the discussion of the 2016 election and the Russian role, give with confidence the sense of what Putin actually decide, decided, which suggests a robust source 
impacts on Kremlin decision making today uh, that did not exist in 1962. And I say a robust force because the revelation in 2016 that the U.S. government was absolutely convinced that Putin had ordered the disinformation campaign should have led to a removal of, of, of a source or two. But yet in 2021, we now know, and certainly publicly we knew in 2022, all of us, the Biden administration came to the conclusion that Putin himself was pushing for war. Not that the Russian military was, not that there was a debate, but that Putin himself was, which means we actually know a lot, a lot more and yet don't know enough than we did in 1962. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Marks, and thank you for the key themes you've raised here, some of which really build nicely on the first panel. I uh, heard a bit about uncertainty, a bit about misperception, and there's some really critically important points here about what was and wasn't known on both sides, including delving into the intelligence institutional or organizational structures within Russia and the U.S. or Soviet Union then, then the us and then drawing the parallels to today, I think a question on many of our minds today is how the lessons from the Cuban Missile Crisis can help us understand the situation in Ukraine. And it's virtually the Biden administration has engaged in the level of proactive disclosure of intelligence uh, that is uh, rarely seen here. And so thank you for drawing out that parallel. There's uh, a lot more we can take away from that. And I will mention also that your remarks we mind of an article by Amy Degart from a decade ago now, I think about 2012, where she talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis as being simplistically remembered mostly as an intelligent success. Yes, and really, there's a lot more to it than that. And there are a lot of organizational failures or at least shortcomings that you've highlighted here, as well as maybe just on a more positive note about what we can learn about it today and some of the contrasts of today. So, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. And finally, yeah, uh, we will turn it over to Philip Zelico, who is joining us remotely. He is the White Burkett Miller Professor of History at the University of Virginia. And prior to the University of Virginia, he was here at Harvard. And before that, he has uh, an illustrious background as a lawyer and career diplomat. We remember, among other things, his role uh, directing the 9-11 Commission. And he has served at all levels of American government during five U.S. administrations, including at the White House, the State Department, and the Pentagon. His last full-time position was as counselor at the State Department, as deputy to Secretary Condoleezza Rice. So, um, well, over to you. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. Thanks very much. I'm actually going to uh, wear my hat as a historian today and just talk about some of the some key intelligence questions on the U.S. side um, that are still intriguing about the missile crisis. I'm going to group the questions into two broad categories. First, um, collection of information to discover the missiles. And second, the analysis of that information to assess the meaning of the deployment. So first category, the actual collection of the intelligence and the discovery of the missiles. As, as Tim mentioned, the Soviet government had developed a plan that they hoped to keep secret. It's a very elaborate plan to deploy an entire group of Soviet forces into Cuba, including these nuclear missiles. They knew that the deployment of a large uh, amount of equipment would be discovered. Um, they believed they could keep secret that the deployment included these nuclear ballistic missiles and, uh, and other things. Actually, um, the Luna tactical nuclear weapons were added very late in the game. Um, the, uh, uh, but the nuclear cruise missiles, the uh, that would be the anti-ship missiles that would have been used against an invasion force, were were part of the original package. So, first basket: Why did the United States discover the secret Soviet plan, which then, of course, changes the whole um, outcome of the crisis? Under that heading, there are five particular questions. First. Was it inevitable that it would be discovered? Was it bound to be discovered? And my answer, that is the, bullet, the nuclear missile piece of it. And my answer is no, it was not inevitable. And partly for the very reasons Tim just talked about. Um, the United States could see that all these ships were going to Cuba. They could see that armed supplies were going there. 
and they decided somewhat bitterly that they would tolerate that after them giving a September warning that if that's all there is, we'll tolerate it. Um, and they deliberated before about that warning before they gave it. And as Tim points out, because of the political explosiveness of intelligence about Cuba, the, the everything about this was being compartmented in a special named intelligence compartment with a very restricted distribution. And so I think if they had not done the U-2 flight, the fateful U-2 flight, I think they would not have discovered the ballistic missiles before Khrushchev unveiled them, as I believe he intended to unveil them in November of 1962, in conjunction with his plan Berlin move. The Kennedy administration knew about the plan Berlin move. They didn't know that he was orchestrating the unveiling of these missiles in conjunction with that move. So first question, was it inevitable that they would have been discovered? I think actually no, because I don't think the U-2 flight was inevitable. Second, why not? Why wasn't there a U-2 flight? Um, and the answer partly is there's the political point, but the main reason there wasn't a U-2 flight is because the Soviet arms package included the same surface-to-air missiles that had shot down the American U-2 over the Soviet Union, piloted by Francis Gary Powers in 1960. So there was a real danger that those same systems would shoot down a U-2 they flew over Cuba. Therefore, there was real risk in, over, in running a U-2 mission over Cuba, as well as almost a little bit of a danger of what it might find out. But that risk was deterring them. Uh, therefore, um, um, the third question arises. Second question was, why were we blind over Cuba? And the answer is because the Soviets put in air defenses that the U.S. knew could shoot down a U-2. The third question then, in that case, why was there a U-2 mission? And that's an interesting story. Um, the director of the CIA, John McCown, um, lobbied hard for that to fly that mission because he believed the fact that the Soviets had put their top surface-to-air missiles in Cuba was a sign they were trying to shield something important. And he thought that that, was prop that might be nuclear missiles, and so we needed to take the risk. Now, it turns out, incidentally, that McCone's reasoning, uh, McCone's instinct that they were hiding something important was true, but it turns out that the Soviets, that the reason the Soviets sent those surface-to-air missiles to Cuba was not because of the nuclear missiles. They had already decided to send those surface-to-air missiles to Cuba as part of a Cuban defense package that they had decided upon in April of 1962. Uh, the next, it was a month later that they decided to add the nuclear ballistic missiles to that, which was a separate decision chain with separate motivations, and that was directed by Khrushchev. But to come back then, McCone insisted that there needed to be a U-2 overflight because there might be something important there. There was a an intense debate about whether to take that risk. And finally, um, McCone won that debate for a single U-2 mission that would skirt Western Cuba very carefully. And then that turned out to be the fateful mission that, that unveiled the Soviet plan. That then, that question, then <laughs> invites the fourth question about the collection. Okay. They took the risk. Why then didn't the Soviets shoot the U-2 down? Um, and did they even know they had been overflown? Um, that's an interesting question. As I, and, and Tim may have some additional insight in this. As I, pieced together, as I pieced together this evidence, I think there is some circumstantial evidence that uh, there's some evidence that appears to indicate that the systems, you, that the systems radars detected the presence of the U-2, but for some reason that I don't know the answer to, the Soviets did not have authorization or were unable to make a decision to fire. And also, I believe they did not tell Moscow that their radars had detected the presence of a possible U-2. So Moscow did not know that there had been a U-2 overflight but I suspect that the, some of the Soviets on the ground in Cuba did suspect that the overflight had occurred. And so I think that that whole story of why they did they detect it, and if so, why didn't they fire, 
is a story that I feel has never been satisfactorily nailed down. Um, the, um, and the particular nature of the mission, it was just that one mission had been designed in a way to make it a little harder for the Soviets to shoot it down. The fifth question then is since the U, there was just this one U-2 overflight, why didn't, why was the U-2 able to detect these missiles? That is, why weren't they better camouflaged, for example? And there the answer appears to be relatively mundane, which is um, the camouflage netting is plastic. They're working in the Cuban summer. It was almost impossible to work during the day under this heavy plastic camouflage netting in that heat and humidity. And the people who were putting everything in place were under great pressure to do it very, very quickly. So they, were, they couldn't just kind of only work at night. So they dispensed with the camouflage and took their chances. I'm not confident that authorities in Moscow didn't understand these sorts of trade-offs people were making in the field. The U-2 flight, by the way, did not discover any tactical nuclear weapons. Even the existence of the Luna missiles, which are the, what, uh, what we call, what American NATO called at the time, free rocket over ground, short range um, missiles, ground to ground missiles. Um, even that handful of missiles was not discovered except by any U-2 mission. They were too hard to see. They were discovered by when we began doing low-level reconnaissance flights flashing over uh, Cuban airspace at about 100 feet off the ground with the F-8Us. Those discovered, the, those discovered some of the, the free rocket over ground sites, and that was during the second week of the crisis. And Kennedy gets briefed about that discovery late in the second week of the crisis. And the, actually, the Pentagon then de starts developing contingency planning to arm the invasion forces with their own tactical nuclear weapons, the Honest John system, as a possible offset to the Soviet system. So um, the first big bucket of questions then had to do with why, was, why did the intelligence community discover this at all? The second big bucket of questions has to do with what did they think the Soviet government, why did they think the Soviet government did this? What was the assessment of all of this? Um, and the, the first point to make about the assessment is what was the assessment? The assessment um, was that the Soviets were doing this in order to up their uh, dramatically change the military, the nuclear military balance, which the United States earlier that year had insisted was a situation of American nuclear superiority. The Americans had insisted that it was American nuclear superiority so that people would believe the commitments we were making to go to nuclear war to defend Berlin. Um, a, a particular example of this was a leaked column to Stuart Alsop, that, or not a leak, but a, a deliberate effort to get Stuart Alsop to write a story broadcasting our confidence in our nuclear power, which was a particular proximate aggravation to Khrushchev in the spring of 62. And then uh, there were further aggravations as we publicly unveiled the Jupiters in Turkey that had been going on for years. Um, but the main point was the Soviets wanted dramatically up their nuclear striking power and do so in a very dramatic way, and that they want to uh, coordinate that with a final conclusive and victorious end to the Berlin crisis that they were preparing for November 1962. There is a separate historical issue as to whether this American assessment was correct. Actually, I believe it was correct. But that was the American assessment. Uh, President Kennedy repeats that assessment on tape multiple times. And actually, that assessment, during the second week of the crisis, that assessment was actually written up and transmitted to American posts. And a comparable and very similar assessment was also arrived at by the British Joint Intelligence Committee. So the first point, what, that, what was that assessment? That's what it was. The second point, though, is, which is very interesting, is who made this assessment? And the answer is it was not the intelligence community, not the intelligence community. And here I want to really stress that the intelligence community's role in this crisis primarily was to collect on hardware. The intelligence communities did not provide high quality analysis of what the Soviets were doing. In fact, the principal estimate they had provided 
in September of 1962 was uh, from the Board of National Estimates is that the Soviets were not going to put nuclear missiles in Cuba because that would be too risky. Um, the, the, this particular assessment that I've just described came from the State Department. It came sp- above all from the former uh, U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, Llewellyn Thompson, Tommy Thompson, who was, I think, possibly maybe short of Robert Kennedy, the most influential advisor to President Kennedy throughout the entire crisis. And um, uh, though he's kind of a low-key guy who doesn't get spotlighted much in the literature, I think he was consistently influential in his way. And I think that was recognized by President Kennedy. And Thompson, by the way, was the person who wrote up that assessment in the table that was then sent out. So you won't find that assessment in the intelligence community products, but very clearly you'll find it in the State Department table that then gets sent out because the State Department is doing the most important qualitative assessments of the Soviet government. I think that's actually bureaucratically and substantively very interesting because I think in general, Presidents don't look as much to the State Department to do such key assessments today as they used to, and I'm not sure that the system we have now is better. But the intelligence community in this era primarily was relied on for uh, technical collection of hardware information and physical information, but the qualitative assessment of what it all meant um, went to, in this case, rather gifted um, analysts who had lived in the Soviet Union and knew its leadership well. Why did this matter? Why did this assessment matter? I think it mattered quite a lot. It mattered above all because if you think your stakes are uh, the most important nuclear confrontation in the Cold War, which was the Berlin confrontation, then when Khrushchev comes in and says, well, we can settle this if you'll pledge not to invade Cuba, The main reaction from President Kennedy and certainly Thompson was, well, sure, we'll take that. Um, Because they knew, they thought the stakes in this crisis were much, much higher than that. They thought they were avoiding a a fatal, potentially fatal and disastrous nuclear crisis in November in which the burden of escalation would have been on the United States. And they would have headed that off successfully here in October. And if the price for that is a no invasion pledge on Cuba, fine, because actually, as President Kennedy knew, he had repeatedly earlier that year already decided that the United States wasn't going to invade Cuba. And he had secretly confided that to the head of the Cuban exiles all the way back in March, April of 1962. So um, stepping back then, the story of why the whole Soviet plan was discovered in the first place is really quite extraordinary and intricate and by no means determined. And then the second basket of things having to do with the assessment of the Soviet move, I think this also uh, did not flow automatically. It did not come from the intelligence community. And the particulars of that assessment were very important in helping to animate the U.S. approach to the diplomacy, the diplomacy that helped resolve the crisis. Thanks. Thank you very much for those terrific insights and really important themes. Again, that we put through a few presentations that really came to light in this one uh, regarding perception and misperception and uh, one of the observations you made that particularly struck me was coming to the right conclusion for the wrong reasons. And we do uh, perhaps have a tendency to attribute uh, more perfect information or assumptions sometimes that are actually the case. So that's some really, really important reminders there for us, understanding the Cuban missile crisis and intelligence there, but also uh, lessons for today. So thank you again so very much for those remarks. We have half an hour left for questions. I certainly have a few, but we have a packed audience here, and I do want to make sure we have time for questions on the floor. So uh, please raise your hands. I see one already from Svetlana, and uh, please do introduce yourself, even if you were on the previous panel, and uh, also uh, if you would like to address one particular panelist. Please, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, 
Kevin on the wall. All kinds of like uh, so you were saying that uh intelligence yeah all kinds of was it all sort of do it. No, 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 no. I'm getting help. Uh, well, get yeah. well, 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 um, I was sorry. Um, I was trying to. Um, I wasn't giving a complete assessment of of the role of intelligence in kid miss crisis. I was trying to be provocative by talking about continuities and discontinuities. On the American side, I I think I talked about how the American intelligence system didn't function that well in the. In the beginning, because the president had placed restrictions on it, and Philip also mentioned that too. Um, that and then I then it talked about uh, what the U.S. intelligence could know and didn't know about the tactical nuclear missiles. Then they knew nothing about command and control. They didn't know anything about Khrushchev's decision-making process. Although a wise analyst, as uh, Philip mentioned, Llewellyn Thompson gave some pretty good advice to President Kennedy in the next time. So, so I would say it's a mixed bag. There's no question that there is a super duper wonderful, you want to teach students which I do, about the role of intelligence and you want to give them a bullseye story. If you're going to have one U2 and you got to make it work and you got to make it uh, count, they chose exactly the right path to take. And they chose that path because of the quadrangle, which was a product of humans. So you got that wonderful bullseye story, but then it's a complicated story on the American side for reasons we both know. But maybe I'm misinterpreting. I heard that as you know, intelligence was who it was kind of program or task force. So you know, well, they sell for the sellers are supposed to all the So with the fact that we'll trade with Cal, I think the second if Katina and Cal would have photographed the FDR, uh, so that's not what was too good. So, but the limitation was that <laughs> the MSL had more for the street limits and make sure what was highlighted and more extended out with the providers, you know. Foundation. <laughs> In the movie, and then uh, now I have to talk about it. So, Biden will all the people that they were in the top line, they were troops of their prey, no bigger what was. So, I think, I think, uh, and it's still the same sound in what the Brazil was, now the choice by a gender, um, animals is. People were taken to nowhere with Soviet concept. But I would never increase the also mentioned. Very briefly, then we do need to move on. But I, I do want to make clear that I said I didn't make those arguments that you were. So I I didn't I didn't say that the U.S. and that I, I I talked about all these holes too. It's it's a, it's a um um. But I I I, I yes I agree with you and and that's why this crisis. Which is so well documented, still it still has some holes, but is a great crisis teaching students about the limitations of intelligence because you've got the bullseye, but you also have these other very important questions that intelligence couldn't answer for the Soviets or the Americans. Thank you very much for the comment. This conversation could continue. Yeah. I hope it will over lunch. Uh, this panel struck a chord with the previous panel to learn a question from Scott Say. Scott Say, yeah, for now. I have one just small story to add to Andrew's. Um, fascinating, but we had a great uh, assessor when I was on the ground for other people. Um, I was 27 and straight out of the but ultra calling in Twitter to me once. Um, and he didn't call it the crisis in total. Um, a date of the famous last weekend of this crisis. 
that he talked about the little more with Jerry Lampley and he didn't want to die in birth. Not a lie, I don't mean to swear it off. But they're both pretty great lines. Question that has to do with um, one thing that I did not understand until very recently reading Larry Schumann's book um, was that reading Holt um, and a parallel of what we were doing with the Jupiter missiles by seven secret orders, manners to uh, not launch them, they need to defuse them so they could not be launched. If they did that, um, that we hope the Soviets would do the same to missiles in Cuba. But I think, you know, that has been talked about in Afghanistan, maybe in some other dates or some other documents. And then we'd speculate uh, on that. Um, we know that Khrushchev did pull back the word in the middle of the crisis, I think not to get it But why is the more evidence in order to talk about that? And in Spain, at least, I know we're at the patient's death. Maybe you turn it over to Chris Randy, where he made to address Helen or where Fuller should. Are you able to hear? They're muted. <laughs> And Chris is, is muted. He's muted. They're both muted. You're muted. Chris, unfortunately, I can't hear you. Are you able to please that? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I can hear you now, um, but I'm afraid I didn't uh, quite hear the, the, the question. Um, what um, I did, and, and I, I published um, uh, a shorter version of, uh, of this in 2015 uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I did carry out some interviews um, with um, people who had been uh, 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 children at the time in the United States, as well as in Britain. Um, the main difference between the two was that in many American schools, and uh, you know, I, I would welcome some comment on this, um, and there's some photographs at the time, children were taught duck and cover exercise. In other words, they were taught how to hide under a desk. And I've got some photographs of that. And I've also got some um, uh, recorded memories of children who did it. In Britain, um, there was, uh, curiously, despite the fact that um, uh, the educational system is uh, um, uh, less diverse, well, more diverse in some ways, this, uh, this uh, did, did not happen. But anybody who, at the age of 10, has been taught how to hide under a desk, never forgets it. And it's not for all worth some, uh, remembering uh, that um, even though uh, the main purpose was not to protect themselves against um, uh, nuclear weaponry, uh, the, the two daughters of the Kennedys uh, are famously photographed at the age of three and five, hiding under the president's desk. So when JFK was making policy, how could he not have been thinking of whether his children would, uh, would grow up? And 50 years later, there's this famous photograph in the Obama era of um, Kennedy's daughter coming along and Obama himself getting under the desk in the exact spot that she had hidden in during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The extraordinary history of the Oval Office does not, to the best of my belief, contain any other photographs like those. If I could uh, come in just on the issue of uh, Soviet command and control, and the question was, did Americans think about and understand Soviet command and control over the systems? Um, the particulars of Soviet command and control over the systems, which Svetlana has studied and Scott Sagan has also looked at, actually were not standard operating procedure for this crisis. There were just particular orders being given for the particular circumstances of this crisis, and there's no way that Americans could have been expected to know those particulars. The, um, the one dominant comment that I'll stress 
is that because a number of the American leaders were themselves combat veterans, there was a basic sensibility about the fog of war and the confusion of combat that especially left President Kennedy worried and uneasy about what would happen if there were clashes. He would, they were they were not as alert as perhaps they should have been to the kinds of dangers Scott Sagan talked about in the previous session. But some of them, and especially President Kennedy, were alert to those dangers. So there's an extended discussion of what might happen at the quarantine line in which the Navy is blustering about things. And Kennedy, the old former Navy lieutenant, PT boat commander, doesn't really trust the assurances and all of that. But the main uh, example to really focus on is what happened on October 27th and how the Americans reacted. In addition to a SAM missile that shoots down an American U-2, um, they're firing anti-aircraft fire, general anti-aircraft guns at American air, uh, uh, um, reconnaissance aircraft all day long. So there's a lot of anti-aircraft gunfire in addition to the SAM missile. And what you notice is at no time does President Kennedy jump to the conclusion that I guess they've decided to go to war. Um, there is a general hesitation to overinterpret the meaning of, uh, of all that gunfire. And then we know a little bit from the Soviet side, thanks to Tim's work, that indeed Khrushchev himself had not really understood what had happened and it left him really uneasy and alarmed. So, uh, in a way, the, uh, the direct answer is very little direct knowledge of the command and control setups. Um, but because of the combat experience and especially President Kennedy's experience, there was at least some measure of humility about what they didn't know and a reluctance to overreact, which I think was very important. But that's something we de echoes of historically in other intelligence situations, including the Allies of World War II, contrasting with Germans. Thank you very much uh, for those responses. And I, I see several hands. We had one at the back, one up here, one over here, and then one over here. Uh, I will note that Christopher Andrew unfortunately had to drop. He had an unavoidable conflict. So we'll convey his thanks um, from all of us to him. Uh, but we do have many hands. So we'll start in the back. Um. Thank you for for uh for uh was uh 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 for uh for first for a long term and for sort of stop us and we'll kind of throw this out for us for this um you did uh talks about slow uh like the visible reaction in the Cold War where there were multi users so the your footage we were we were just off of and so if you were shooting by a second. Um, now I'm going to look at that. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Lake, like, in order to find the populace on what nuclear war is capable of, uh, that obviously affected it. I was, as Fitzgerald was brought up in terms of the decision where I was the stars to the past. How can we state that, that Mr. Lake, on the time, affects the policy of moving uh, forward on the populations? Or at least all in and all say, oh, um, oh, I'm including the world odds because it's not from the base every single day. Great question. Thank you. Who would like to tackle that one? Well, I'll start with, um, sorry. Uh, um, that's a great question. Um, uh, part of the answer involves thinking about the, the role of the population on, make, on shaping military decision making. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the the American and the, I would argue the American and the Soviet populations played no role uh, in the decision, the decision making in the 13 days. I think the American population played a role inadvertently because of the midterm campaign and the political considerations associated with that. But once it happened, I, I don't think the population and its understanding of nuclear danger played a role, but it certainly played a role with the leaders. And, um, one of the things that um, uh, strikes me about both Kennedy and Khrushchev is that they both needed time to make the right decision. Uh, John Kennedy um, took a while 
uh, to decide um, to go with the uh, well, the quarantine or the blockade. Um, yeah. President uh, had a series of many options that his advisors provided him. One was an airstrike. Yeah. One was a, an invasion. One was a quarantine. And then there were combinations. You start with a quarantine and then you leave open the possibility of that invasion. Or you uh, have an airstrike, which then is followed by an invasion. But the three basic food groups, if you will, those three. And um, I, I, I think that, that, um, that in Tom Kennedy, John Kennedy, not his brother, but John Kennedy, quite a long time to decide that an airstrike was not the right way to go. And I think part of the reason that he took so long is that um, he had drawn a red line because he was certain that Khrushchev would not put missiles in Cuba. Uh, and after his brother had used their bank channel, to check on this, he decided that one way of blunting the public and criticism of his a work in Cuba, of his approach to Cuba, was to draw a line publicly. I would argue just the same as President Obama drew red lines in 2012 during a, a campaign. And the line he drew was that he, and I'm paraphrasing, would not countenance the placement of offensive missile systems in Cuba. Now, once the Soviets did that, now, by the way, there were some around Kennedy that saw that as a deterrent. I don't think Kennedy did. I don't think Kennedy thought the Soviets would do this. But his brother and John McCone both worried that Khrushchev might and thought this would be a useful deterrent. So not everybody had the same idea of the red line, but I think the president saw it mainly in the political terms. Once he had done that, he had no choice but to react very strongly when the Soviets went ahead. He had told the world. American prestige was on the line. He had to get those missiles out. And he couldn't figure out how to do that with a blockade. So it took him a while. And, and, and he was really angry in the beginning about being betrayed by the Soviets. Khrushchev, on his, uh, for his part, makes a series of decisions out of emotion that actually increase the danger of the crisis. As Philip mentioned, and I know Svetlana knows, um, that, that Luna and tactical missiles are actually added in September of 62, after Khrushchev begins to worry that Kennedy knows what's, what's happened. After Kennedy makes that speech that draws that line, Khrushchev, instead of saying, oops, I've just raised the crisis. I've just, oh my God, I'm, gonna, I'm walking into a crisis. He actually ups his ante and decides to put tactical nukes that could be used. He never intended using strategic nukes, but the tactical nukes could be used. And what's so interesting to me is despite his knowledge of nuclear danger, Khrushchev made the decision to put tactical nuclear missiles. I mean, the Soviet military suggested, but he made the decision. And the night when he was waiting to hear what Kennedy would give in his famous October 22nd speech, Khrushchev argued for giving the commanders in on Cuba the right to use tactical nuclear weapons if Kennedy invaded. So what I find bizarre is that the, the nuclear danger, which Khrushchev should have known a lot about, does not restrain him. Ultimately, he doesn't do this. His advisors tell him not to. He takes a deep breath. And then from that point, point on, Khrushchev is making decisions in order to reduce nuclear danger. But both Kennedy and Khrushchev, despite their knowledge of the fact that things can get out of hand, we're very close to using, but we're not very, but we're close to using violence and we're considering using violence in this crisis. Thank you very much. And um, we I have. I really admire. And uh, no. I'm, I'll never forget when the night I saw her 22nd house. It was like hair more of the day. And uh, a lot of hour later, I was living in Fort Bragg, Zion. I can call and be more into the world. I'm pretty sure that I was considerable to my killer tatters. It's sure to go there and struggle. I'm sure. And uh, it was a Monday night. And so the next Friday's days, we didn't like most of the speech at all. Now we knew what was going on. But we got absolutely zero information about. What was going to take place in the other room? Because all we knew was we were packing up our church 
We chipped them on the ring. Well, we checked wheels. We were isolated. Isolated at six months in my wife, six months pregnant. And there was no information that came down at least to my levels. And all we were doing was talk with citizenry in there. there. We had no idea the sequence of events. Other than the idea that we were from this or from the war. I mean, there was nothing in between it. I just wonder if there's any information about how well our troops in, in Europe are informed or if anybody has any ever steered, you know, what the fall there was to a new law was down to the command and command them down to the Hector commander because I didn't tell you some time. I had zero information. I love her the since 60 or that. I think about it was 60 years later. And some of it comes back biblically. I had no damn information. What? So little. Thank you very much for the question. Um, Phil, did you want to talk about? Well, sure. Uh, uh, um, that was in, that was interesting, and I'm confident that today's lieutenant in Poland is is similarly in the dark <laughs> with the uh, with say the 173rd Airborne Brigade, or uh, maybe uh, sitting in uh, one of the Baltic countries. Um, there, the, you know, um, and actually, if you think about it, if we told all the lieutenants what our war plans are, that would not be considered great operational security. So um, I think that the uh, there were war plans as to how to use uh, your division in 1962, and there were people six levels above you who knew what those plans were, but your job was just to get, get ready for war. And we have units now that are not necessarily engaged in doing um, daily work on military assistance who are there uh, mainly to be ready for contingencies and their job is to be operationally capable to execute a plan whose details they do not know. Thank you very much. We have just under 10 minutes left and I saw three hands. So if uh, I can please have each of you ask your question and then we'll turn to the panelists for responses so over here first. Hi, hello, hi, I'm the Ivan Rams, the Stock or Nancy Cadden. And I'm wondering, um, kind of contrast with Prusad and Kennedy in the role of leaders in the family intelligence, because I can't have the law in the agent search today as well. I think it's sort of a way of much more different than previous day in terms of ways people's lot of receptives because it happens there was more of a uh, dispersion in most of the at that time. But was there a big impact on the way that the individual leaders and status and interpreted intelligence and were there any significant differences in your own Great question. Thank you. Uh, we had two more hands that I saw earlier. Uh, do we still have two questions? Yeah. Tight. I'm Lanthan from Tom and Anthony. Let's just start with the chorus. Two things. One, uh, uh, Tim's point out the tactical and the free rockets of the ground, and Bill talked about in your original deployment the plan, in fact, they already had eight tactical So the additional, it's September, so it's the with a Mark was a small acre that the idea of it, you know, seeing the deployment in the side of the car with tactical equipments, this enormous degree of rashness, which was shared by both the United States and the Soviet Union. And Scott Zayden mentioned our previous team, you know, airplanes on alert at one of the two, and air to air out and the little weapons that are in right? So they swing all little. They have got some of this recklessness beforehand. All in nuclear policies of both countries seems to be proximate cause of the danger absolute. And the second factor that does is the fratlessness on the American side. He said, at one point in Pensacon Beach, John Comets and our allies are just suffering with us on this because they think we are dependent about England. The assassination and Tim Smogos, Sandy North, all them sappers 
some of which were clear, certainly humans, since all innovations were coming, and that people were consume. So that drove also so many practices. And so I was in by seeing as late as 1990, did a review of Tim's book for Persinka with an old gamble. The distinguished writer, John, says, well, a lot of that good work. Maybe he was sick of saying, the human missile practice is all about unprovoked aggression on top one side, so, and, and we're strengthened and cautioned by both sides. I think part of the correct which is 12, where uh, Tim, I love your comments, and Philip as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I only saw those two hands in the end. So um, if the panelists would like to address first Nicole's question, contrasting leadership of Khrushchev and JFK, and then on deployment and recklessness, Tim, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, thanks for the questions. Uh, in, in terms of, um, I'll leave it to, to Philip to talk about Kennedy uh, and intelligence. Um, um, it, it was a challenge um, to... Uh, to document Khrushchev's absorption of intelligence um, uh, was clear from the um, records of the Presidium and the, the, the occasional there stenographic accounts of, uh, of meetings. And in some cases, the um, Malin notes included debates that it, it, Khrushchev, there was pushback. And Khrushchev um, admired and respected uh, Anastas Mikoyan. And often the pushback was from Mikoyan. And uh, there is a very important example of that in the Berlin crisis. Actually, before the, before the world knew there was a 1961 Berlin crisis, when Khrushchev said, uh, you know, if the, if the Americans don't give us what we want, why don't we just shoot down one of their planes? And... Uh, Koyan explained the consequences of doing that. And then in the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's a lot of good evidence. It's also very important to post. So a lot of work done about Mikoyan. Um, that it shows Mikoyan's role in trying to inform his, uh, uh, his leader and uh, how. Well, um, so I think that's a more important source of, of information for Khrushchev. We, there is evidence of him responding to information but I, I, I think he was a, a man, a, a, a very vibrant, imaginative, emotional, uh, self-confident man who usually thought he knew best. And so it's hard to penetrate that kind of world with contrary information. As to Tom's point, um, this could be a seminar. Um, and, and of course, of course, Soviet concerns about the stability and security of ally and Caribbean matter. I would just say that you need, to, we need to think of that in the context of general Soviet insecurity. And yes, Cuba mattered a lot. But Khrushchev gets awfully upset about what's going on in Laos. And Khrushchev is very upset about the fact that he feels he can be pushed around in Germany. The fact that Americans aren't listening when he keeps telling them that the situation is intolerable in Berlin, why won't they react? So I think there's a generalized sense of insecurity. Khrushchev has a plan for dealing with it, which I've called the meniscus plan, which is he, he tells the Politburo, we're going to presidium, we're going we're gonna to raise tension in international politics like pouring water into a goblet. We're going to put the water right to the edge. And that's the way to deter American power. We have to scare them. I think Khrushchev, um, if I were doing improv, I would have it's like a goblet here. But I'll let it disappear. Um, I believe Khrushchev was not interested in balance, in balance of nuclear weapons. He was interested in the balance of fear. And he needed Americans to fear um, Soviet power the way he feared American power. And so that's how I view the place of the missiles. And Philip knows that I also can believe from looking at the way in which Khrushchev's ideas of what he was going to achieve in 62 evolves, I think he gets really excited in the summer when it all seems to be going the right way after Raul Castro comes and visits him. And there's this evidence 
that he begins to have grand thought. I'm not sure that Berlin was the reason he starts the process. I'm not convinced of that. But I do think by the end of it, I agree with Phil that there were, he, he had this idea that there would be a nuclear crisis in November when he could finally get the Americans to do what he wanted them to do. Yes, protecting Cuba mattered, but I think that whole is the sole explanation. But there's no doubt American misbehavior in Cuba mattered and increased Soviet fears and also increased the Soviet sense of insecurity. We can't protect our allies. Um, on the issue of uh, American plans to invade Cuba, um, we do have very good evidence from uh, a former Cuban intelligence official that they knew that Kennedy had told the Cuban exiles he wasn't going to invade Cuba. Um, and at the time, the Soviets made the decision to send the missiles to Cuba. They thought Castro wouldn't take them because they thought that uh, the Soviets thought he won't take them because they think he, they, Castro will think this makes his situation more dangerous, not less. Um, the, uh, and actually, if you look at the evidence on the Cuban side, the Cubans say, um, we didn't take them because we were, thought they would help with us an American invasion danger. Um, we took them because we thought it was our duty to help our ally who was helping us in these other ways. Um, and, you know, um, as, as socialist comrades, and they had stood by Castro during something called the Escalante affair a little earlier in the year. But. I still think that Tom's general point about the recklessness of the deployments and uh, and a lot of the overlooked dangers um, in these situations is is fundamentally right. I just want to dwell for a moment, though, on the other question having to do with how the leaders assessed each other. Because here I think there are some interesting features for the present day in comparing Putin and Khrushchev and maybe even Biden and Kennedy. And I'll try to be very brief. I believe that I believe John F. Kennedy had an unusually gifted sensibility about foreign leaders and thinking about what foreign leaders might think. I think he was exceptional in this respect. I, in, in something I've written, I've referred to it as a quality of clinical empathy. Um, that empathy, by the way, didn't make Kennedy arrogant about how much he knew it actually tended to make him more humble about how much he knew, and it made him inquisitive. It's one reason he leans on Tommy Thompson, is because he knows foreigners well to ask these questions in these ways and wants to hear what Thompson thinks. Now, um, Khrushchev doesn't know foreigners at hardly at all. Khrushchev has very little experience with foreign travel, very few, relatively few interactions with foreigners, and now I want to contrast that back with Putin. Putin is almost infinitely more experienced about foreigners and the West than Khrushchev was. For, uh, Putin is fluent in German. He spent a lot of his life in Germany. My God, even I have met with Vladimir Putin, which tells you that he meets all kinds of people. So, and my point about that is then now ask yourself this question. Who, uh, who actually... Um, really understood the foreigner, how did that pay off? I believe Khrushchev's fundamental unease around foreigners and his inexperience with them occasionally made him humble, though it, it's interspersed with these periods of impulsive arrogance, as Tim knows. I believe Putin sense a vast knowledge of the foreigners actually has lent a certain overconfidence and arrogance to his judgments not a humility. So in a way, it's the actual inverse of the John F. Kennedy situation. And that Putin thinks, oh, I know these guys, I've got there, I know them, I know how they'll react. And I think he's made some really significant misjudgments. And we may not be at the end of those yet. The caution about Biden versus Kennedy is um, Biden, at least as a senator, tended to be very confident in his judgments of foreigners. <laughs> Uh, maybe a little too much so from time to time because he'd met people and he thought about these things for a long time. I'm hopeful that in office as president that that, um, that confidence has been tempered and that in this crisis he's um, engaging the kind of humility that 
characterize Kennedy's behavior, um, aided, for instance, by men like Bill Burns, with his own vast experience of the Russian leadership, and who I think has been very influential in this crisis. Thank you, Phil, for joining us for she. Thank you, Tim, for joining us in person. And I'll invite everyone to please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.